Hello, everyone. This is Ron Gerber from Angel Beat. I'm glad to have Matthew Place, one of the top solution architects at Datrium. What he's going to be talking about is DR, cloud-based DRs. He would use this new acronym DRAAS, or Disaster Recovery as a Service, and talking about how Datrium works very strategically with VMware and AWS to provide a very robust disaster recovery solution. Uh, we've seen this be extremely well received at many live angel beat events at many past webinars. So I know you'll have a lot of interest in this. I encourage everyone as well to go to angelbeat.com or datrium.com for the latest information where you can watch this video. You can attend virtual summits. So without any further ado, let me turn it over to Matthew. All yours. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate it. Yep. So again, uh, Matthew Place here. I'm a uh, principal solution architect with Datrium. Um, and I've got a, a long history with VMware and uh, multiple types of infrastructure solutions and things like that. And um, you know, really passionate about what we're doing here uh, with Datrium in particular. What we're the, the impact we're having on the disaster recovery marketplace. So in terms of this, let me get this going here. So, so you folks have some semblance of, or some idea of, you know, kind of what to expect in this, uh, in this discussion here is, you know, kind of want to talk about a few of the new reasons why DR is even more important than just the traditional, hey, something went down, I need to recover somewhere else. Uh, There's some interesting uh, factors going on in that space and they have unique implications on the potential DR solution and whether or not they're, uh, they're actually viable. Uh, you know, so from that, then we're going to move into, you know, just a, a brief overview of some of the um, you know, more common traditional DR challenges. And the idea of setting the, this is kind of setting the stage for the Datrium DR as a service solution. We're going to describe what it is, how it functions, and tie it back to each of these traditional challenges, as well as, uh, more importantly, some of these more recent uh, reasons for engaging DR. Hopefully we'll uh, get some questions throughout the discussion, but uh, otherwise we'll leave some Q&A at the end. So in terms of some of the newer reasons why DR is ever more present and, and ever more important for organizations, uh, you can kind of see that you know, displayed out here on the chart. Ransomware is, uh, is one of the top reasons folks are actually engaging their DR capabilities or leveraging their DR policies and plans. Um, and that's, that's really interesting because the nature of ransomware is a bit different than some of these other failures that are listed out on the diagram as well. Uh, what really makes it different is the, the data, the, uh, the data, the application data is actually getting attacked and in many cases encrypted, held for ransom and so forth. And simply recovering from backup may not necessarily be the most efficient, most expedient way of recovering from ransomware. And if you're looking to provide a disaster recovery you know, me mechanism to, uh, as the approach to recovering from that ransomware event, no different than you would a power outage and natural disaster, the thing that really makes it different because of this encryption is the fact that you can't you generally cannot just recover from your most recent protected copy of your environment. So if you think back to traditional backup and DR mechanisms, we're going to have a number of possible restore points based on our retention schedules and things like that. And when, when you perform these disaster recovery failovers, far too often the existing, existing legacy solutions out on the marketplace um, are capable of recovering you in many cases in an orchestrated fashion, but it's only to the most recent restore point. And that really doesn't work very well for the ransomware use case. We're going to go into that in a little bit more detail as we get further into the discussion. Uh, but, you know, going, you know, kind of one step back into the broader challenges with disaster recovery, and these are things that we're going to focus in on from a Datrium perspective, that these are areas that we uh, set out to address when we develop this capability. But traditionally, DR has been extremely challenging because you know, despite the, the amount of time, effort, and money invested in building out a DR solution, and many of these are bespoke, you, know, you may be using similar technologies off the shelf, but at the end of the day, 
someone out there has to take ownership of the integration uh, and deployment of these various disparate technologies to hopefully do something useful as a cohesive whole. And you know, with so many moving parts and so many points of integration and things that have to be kept up, these can get not only expensive, but they're very complex just by their nature. You got multiple tiers, multiple you know vendors, multiple points of integration, and then you've got the second site that you actually want to recover to, and all of those things contribute to the overall you know cost or expense of of a DR solution using traditional tooling. Now, if you move into the other you know major you know challenge historical challenge with disaster recovery, despite it being expensive and despite um, again, all of the effort that may have been put into designing and deploying a capability at the end of the day using traditional or legacy DR technologies, no matter how much time or effort and money is you put into it, you're still left with a solution that you have to question whether or not it'll actually work if and when you need to hit the big button. And that's where the reliability aspect comes into it. Everything ranging from the complexity, the inherent complexity of the solution, to the just general moves, ads, and changes that happen as a general functioning data center environment. You know, we've got to add VMs, remove VMs, change firewall rules, policy changes, network changes, et cetera. Despite many of our best efforts, a lot of these things are done without actually backing those changes into how does that relate to the DR policy? How does that affect backups? And as a result, then the what was once a potentially viable DR capability is now out of sync with the reality of the organization and the infrastructure and therefore is no longer viable. Those are two ever present historical challenges with disaster recovery. So cost and complexity and the lack of reliability. Now, if we, as we start moving away from kind of the problem set, the one really important thing that I think I wanna, I wanna highlight here, and that's hopefully what this chart is meant to represent is that Datrium sees the world differently. Uh, while we're talking about disaster recovery today, we, we, we pr provide coverage out of our product, uh, out of our platform for many different core data center and multi-cloud functions. But even with disaster recovery kind of being the culmination of multiple uh, underlying subsystems within a, a data center infrastructure, you're talking about primary storage, you're talking about uh, the backup mechanism, your orchestration layer for the actual DR run books and you know, perhaps storage replication and various other elements that all need to work together in concert to achieve a viable DR outcome. The, our philosophy is that the historical challenges associated with DR due to its complexity and cost and unreliability is a direct correlation or direct result rather of the fact that the traditional organizations are solving each of those functions or needs or problems, primary storage, backup, et cetera, individually, right? And then after the fact, after a backup vendor and technology has been selected, after the primary infrastructure is installed and deployed, and after all these things are done, then we try to integrate all of this together and actually make it do something that out of the gate, it was never intended to do uh, right off the bat. So that's super important. We look at a completely different fashion. We say this is one, you know, converged outcome that we're looking to achieve, which is disaster recovery. And to do that, we have to lay the proper foundation, starting from perhaps even as far back as primary storage, but definitely from a data protection standpoint, you cannot divorce the two concepts, DR and backup. And the challenge with the, uh, the, the historical solutions out there, as you can kind of see depicted on these charts, you know, there's been a lot of improvement over time, especially going back from tape into even the first shift into like a data main type of uh, infrastructure, massive benefits there in context of where we were at, at that time. But as we've progressed over, you know, the, the next decade, we've seen a lot of innovation, but it's still been fragmented. It's still been backup. It's still been, you know, DR as an afterthought and, then we bring the cloud aspect into this and then it becomes a, even more challenging because how do you leverage cloud to get the best out of it from a DR use case? And that's what we're gonna talk about next. So as we talk about really what, you know, that cloud use case looks like for disaster recovery, kind of hearkening back to what I just said about our different viewpoint on the world that you can't try to, you, we can no longer afford to solve these problems 
individually and in vacuums and then try to pull it all together at the last minute to do something useful like a disaster recovery capability. And that is the DNA of Datrium. And so if you just look at our founders and you look at the pedigree of, of where they've come from, what they did, the ownership that they've had of prior organizations, and then from a technology standpoint, the, the, uh, the, the patents and so forth, everything that, it, that is necessary to make a viable DR endpoint or um, end state uh, <clears throat> has been, is just simply a part of our DNA, right? Every, each one of our founders is bringing expertise from, you know, the, the core of VMware and the hypervisor through, you know, the pioneering of data reduction. How does that relate to primary storage? How does that relate to backup? How do we efficiently move data from one place to another? And then bringing this all together with some type of orchestration capability. And so what that results to, or, you know, the result of that effort is really Datrium's disaster recovery as a service offering. And, and it comes in a number of different deployment models, depending on the uniqueness of the organization, what we're actually trying to achieve. And that's the beauty of this software. It's a single software platform that can be deployed, as I said, in different modalities to address different needs, but it's still a, a, the same consistent platform, the same consistent operational model, and the same consistent set of capabilities and features. So I'm gonna take a breath right there and see if anybody has any questions. Uh, for, me, uh, for me, I'm good. Yeah, these slides are, look familiar. Gotcha, I appreciate that. No worries. So starting kind of, you know, 100,000 foot view and down on the solution. I want to step through a few of the unique capabilities and how we might deploy this, those different deployment uh, you know, methods and where we would use them and why they're important. So from a Datrium perspective, what we're, what we're able to do is address directly the challenges that I mentioned previously. The first was the complexity and cost of disaster recovery. The second is the unreliability of disaster recovery. And then I'll, I'll you know, I guess I'm going in reverse order, but uh, and then lastly is the, the ever-present ransomware use case for disaster recovery. Because if you, you know, may be well and good, you can probably go get a DR mechanism in a lot of different places in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the market today, but can any of those DR capabilities really provide you uh, effective recovery from a ransomware event, and I, you know, generally, I would say that you, you know, the answer is no. <laughs> so we're going to look at what those uh, what those pieces are and how that all comes together. Now, what is Datrium DRAS? What we've done is we've taken a software as a service platform that we developed, and we host and maintain that on behalf of our customers. And this DRAS platform contains all of the orchestration necessary to fail over from one site to another. And in, in this particular case with DRAS, that second site where we would fail over to is the VMware Cloud on AWS. Now, what really is interesting about trying to comply, combine rather this DR orchestration capability with a cloud backup and cloud data center capability is that we're now able to direct, address directly one of those key challenges, which is the cost of the solution. So when you think about a traditional DR, you're building out primary site, building out secondary site, and then the incremental things in between, storage replication, orchestration, et cetera. You're talking about a tremendous amount of cost, typically, in order to provide DR for a targeted set of workloads. In this case, what we're saying is, as a starting point, you can now do VMware Cloud as your DR data center, but spin it up on demand and only pay for it as you need it or as you use it. And that really changes the kind of the economic model for DR. No longer do we have to go and build out a full brick and mortar data center with full of infrastructure on the off chance we may have to use it for disaster recovery. Now we can essentially buy a service that pr continually protects our data, puts that data in the cloud, and then if and when we actually have to do a failover, we can spin up a full VMware Cloud AWS instance just in time, fully automated, and then immediately start our workloads once that instance is operational. And then uh, you know, we're back up and running in a much shorter period of time than traditional D, uh, DR mechanisms 
again, without the expense of a full brick and mortar data center build out. Any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, help me understand, I guess, the uh, configuration of Datrium in the VMware cloud on AWS. Is it, is it through cloud formation uh, for AWS or is it in marketplace? Um, and then I guess once that infrastructure is built, mm -hmm. are, is, the, is the customer not charged for anything? So it sounds like it's uh, pay for use, right? Yep. And on demand, but the infrastructure needs to be, you know, almost, you know, sitting idle. Uh, waiting for you know some trigger point, and yeah. at which time it will fire up all of the appropriate resources. You know, uh, the EC2s, uh, the S3, um, uh, things like that. So I guess help me understand uh, any costs that would be associated for having that environment sort of more on the ready than in, yeah. in use. Yeah, good question. So yeah, what, what you're what you're alluding to is that there are some choices that can be made to tailor the DR solution for the requirements that we're, we're driving towards, whether that be, hey, I, I need this up and running as quickly as possible, uh, spare no expense, or hey, cost is, is key, uh, it trumps everything else, and I'm willing to take a slight uh, hit to the time it takes to spin up the environment. I'm willing to wait for a little bit to and not have it ready immediately, you know, j just if I can save the money up front. So we'll, we'll step through each of those options. Uh, but to get to your first question, this is a fully managed service. So everything from the underlying AWS infrastructure, inclusive of everything on top of that from a VMware or a VMware cloud perspective is handled. It's, it's, it's built and provisioned, uh, deployed and maintained, upgraded and supported uh, uh, singularly from, from a Datrium perspective. So, so there is no need, I'm sorry? So Datrium, what, has a, has a team um, that, that manages that, uh, that environment? Yes, we have a managed services team um, as a part of our agreement with VMware as an MSP uh, for VMware Cloud that is responsible for maintaining these environments. However, that team is supported by our software platform that contains a tremendous amount of uh, automation and orchestration to deal with the care and feeding of these environments from the initial standup of a VMware instance, uh, including, as I said, the AWS infrastructure, uh, you know, through its entire life cycle, uh, inclusive of tearing it down, expanding it on demand, uh, or, or as we call it, auto scaling. Mm -hmm. So again, what, what, what's interesting is our uh, end customers were looking at VMware Cloud through this context, through a Datrium DRAS, but have also looked at it, uh, you know, independently. What well, the biggest difference that they'll find is you're not going to have to get in there and have deep knowledge and expertise around AWS or even VMC. You're not going to have to interact with the VMC, uh, you know, GUI or portal directly. Everything else is that you really need to do for the DR use cases is automated and orchestrated. Okay, so customers don't, or they do. Uh, I guess have management capabilities of that infrastructure in VMware? Yeah, good question. So in terms of the fundamental spin up, the building of the VMs, the SDDC instances, the AWS and things like that, they don't need to uh, have direct control over any of those types of things. But once it's stood up, they yeah. do have control over um, the environment from the perspective of operating it through vCenter just like they would their on-premise environment. So as, as this thing is stood up, whether it be on demand and now it's operational or in, in another case, we haven't gotten to talk about this yet, but what we call pilot light, where we can set up a small VMC environment, you know, minimal number of servers, you know, say three VMC hosts as a starting point so that we have an always on footprint um, that we can leverage and then auto scale as we need to actually engage it for DR. With those operational environments, our end customers can get in there and do as they please from a VMware vCenter perspective. Okay, very good. Are we getting to your getting to the answer to your question there? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm just okay, trying to get perfect. an understanding of how it works uh, off in the cloud and who's responsible for. Yeah, the yeah and we're we're going to step so, through some of that. We're going to step through some of that in, in more detail, and I've got some slides, uh, some graphics here that might help, uh, particularly if you're uh, graphically oriented like I am. Yeah, um, so, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But now I guess just one more question, you know, sure. I guess before when you're defining a DR, it's obviously not everything in the customer's environment. So 
you know, you, you're starting to work with, you know, checklists of, hey, listen, what applications are you looking to, to um, you know, protect, you know, what application is aligned to what RTO. So you got different RTO levels. Yes. Uh, you got maybe different RPO levels and, mm -hmm. you know, you got data sets and essentially they just fit into those buckets. Data set A is, you know, requires, you know, under five minutes re recovery time. Uh, data set B is, you know, anywhere between an hour and four hours or whatever it is. So, I mean, I guess where I'm going with that is, you know, it's a little bit of professional services helping customers understand A, the data sets and then how to configure policies and how to align those data sets with those policies to be able to fit within, you know, whatever yeah. RTO we yeah. it is. So, exactly. Uh, so I just need to understand maybe that sort of bridge point because that's what essentially builds out the DR. You know, yes. You've got to have that information first and then you can build out, you know, that DR environment. So yeah. maybe help me, you know, what's that bridge look like with, with you guys? Uh, sure. Maybe that's a, an escander working with the customer, you know, yeah. doing data collection and then, you know, uh, filling out forms, sending it to the back end of you guys. And then, you know, that, that managed services team turns around and does the rollout uh, yep. of what, you know, resources are required in that environment, creating a cloud formation stack or whatever it is. And then voila, does, does that sound about right? Yeah, I mean, it sounds right. At the end of the day, if you want to maybe oversimplify it just before we move on, it, you know, if you think in general sense, all of the things that are needed in any DR solution for it to be viable, inclusive of the many of the things that you mentioned, like rationalizing the applications and their, uh, you know, their level of importance and to those levels of importance, what uh, do we attach from an RPO, RTO perspective, et cetera, and then, you know, driving some around uh, consistency groups or whatever you want to call them, but what are we going to recover in, in, in what groupings and in what order and all that kind of stuff. That absolutely has to be figured out no matter the DR solution. The biggest difference with Datrium is all of the stuff from an infrastructure perspective and from a tooling perspective, inclusive of the orchestration, we've really simplified all of that through our software platform so that your focus can be on those things that are unique to a, a, a potential customer engagement or an environment or a data center or whatever. And instead of being distracted with the entirety of the puzzle where you have to you know, build the same mousetrap you've built for the last 12 customers, you know, just to get the infrastructure there and the orchestration pieces in place before you can even program it with what makes that environment unique from an application standpoint. Okay. So that's kind of at a very high level where the, where the, where we bridge, bridge over from what we do to what a professional services engagement would look like through the channel. Okay. Fair enough. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So I'm not going to go too much more into these details right now, just for the sake of time. We're going to hit these later on another slide, but cloud backup, instant RTO, uh, ransomware recovery and continuous compliance are super critical uh, and, and huge differentiators for what we're providing from a DR as a service perspective, uh, uh, apart from, you know, all the other, you know, uh, DR as a service uh, offerings that uh, are in the marketplace today. So we're going to hit those as we roll forward. But the last thing that I want to, describe here before we move forward uh, that this diagram is helpful for is that our methodology now is that it doesn't matter it's VMware anywhere it doesn't matter what your platform your uh, current environment is on whether that's you know here we'll pick on a Dell EMC or a Nutanix or a pure backed infrastructure or perhaps even a Datrium DBX or disaggregated HCI architecture uh, on-prem, if that is your primary data center, it doesn't matter which one of those environments is the source, through DRAS Connect, we can bring that data into and provide this DR as a service capability uh, across all of those platforms now. Okay. And so that's, that's a, a huge differentiator for us uh, going forward. Now, what, is, what does disaster recovery really look like? As we talked about, there are multiple source options. You know, bottom left, you can see it could be somebody's SAN-based infrastructure, various NAS and HCI offerings, or it could be even Datrium DHCI. And through this mechanism, we can bring that data in and provide this orchestrated DR experience. The other thing that DRES Connect brings to the table, this is really interesting for certain customers, certain use cases, is as the as the uh, demand and, and utilization of VMC it grows with customers and they start to deploy more steady state workloads out there, 
they're going to find themselves in the, in, in the same challenge that they have uh, on prem, which is, Hey, I have a workload and it may be of sufficient importance that I at least have to back it up and perhaps maybe even provide a DR capability for it. And uh, up until this point, there've been a limited number of uh, potential options for providing those functions to workloads that are running uh, steady state in a VMware cloud instance. And uh, you know, if you were going to do DR today, the traditional approach is, all right, well, I have my first SDDC. I'm going to go ahead and spin up another SDDC. I'm going to have that running all the time. I'll have SRM in between, perhaps, um, use some type of replication, more than like a vSphere replication. And that is how I'm going to protect my primary VMware Cloud instance with another always-on secondary VMware Cloud instance. And certainly viable solution, definitely functional. The one drawback is just like any other cloud service uh, resource, they're all metered. And if you're using it or if it's, if it's active and it's assigned and provisioned to you, whether you're actually driving workload on it or not, and it's just sitting idle, you're paying for those resources. So it really messes with the economics of DR from you know, cloud to cloud. What we're gonna, what we can do now with DRES Connect is instead of having that second SDDC instance always on all the time, what we'll do instead is leave that primary instance up, leverage DRES Connect to back up that data uh, into an S3 back data store, which isn't really you know, depicted very well here, but there's an S3 back data store that is front-ended by our software, applies things like data reduction, uh, you know, uh, um, fingerprinting, encryption, and various other data services and, and, and housekeeping as it relates to our backup and DR mechanisms. So we take that data from that primary SDDC instance, we back that up in a very cost-effective way. And what's really interesting, you'll see on the next slide, uh, two, two or three, three slides later, that that backup repository backed by S3 is not simply a backup target, it is also a live mountable data store. So what we can do with this DRISC Connect in this context is to spin up on demand a, a second VMware Cloud instance, then mount this backup you know, S3 back data store as an NFS data store inside that second instance. And, and once that's done, we can immediately start our VMs, you know, hydration free, you know, no VM conversion, et cetera. Okay. And, but you're accessing now that data on S3, is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, proxy by our, yeah, proxy by our software, and to kind of give you perspective of how it's supposed to work, I'll, I, I can show you that here, but uh, the, the S3 back data store will provide somewhere in the order of 50,000 IOPS, maybe 500 megabytes uh, per second of throughput, um, and I think uh, tens of milliseconds of latency, less than 10 milliseconds of latency is what, we're, uh, what we understand it to be. Um, and so the idea was is that that's there to provide sufficient resources um, as we are bringing those workloads online, but they're not gonna stay there on that S3 back data store. What we will do, and let me step through this here, is this is where we're starting. So we've replicated that data through our software from any one of these starting points. It could be a cloud instance, or it could be something on-prem that data gets into the Amazon infrastructure via our software and gets stored in a data reduced, fully encrypted format um, in that S3 bucket. Mm -hmm. And in the event of a disaster, and this is an on-demand scenario where we do not have a, another SDDC running, what we'll do is as the disaster is declared, we'll go ahead and spin up a new cloud SDDC instance. We'll do that through our software and that, that part is automated, okay? And then once that's operational, what you have effectively is a VMware clustered in Amazon's data center. And what, we're, what our S3 back data store called Cloud DVX provides is the ability to mount that live as an NFS data store, and then we can immediately start those VMs. Once they're started, we're going to continue to start additional VMs through as a part of the runbook policy. And then at the same time, we'll start a uh, storage vMotion in the background to move the target data set into the actual local data stores on vSAN inside the VMware Cloud SDDC instance. So they'll be running typically in this case on the uh, i3 uh, you know, .metal uh, instances with local NVMe and at which point you'll have you know, the, the full sub millisecond and 
all the performance that you're, you're looking for or would expect out of such an environment. And then what's happening here though, what really makes this unique and nobody else on the planet does this is that as we're sending that data in, we know precisely what that data looks like before we did the actual failover. Now, let's say we're running steady state and we've resolved the issue on the, the source data centers. Now we wanna fail back. We have another orchestration policy in there that corresponded with each failover. There'll be a corresponding fail back policy. And what's really interesting about the failback is because we knew the state of that, v, those, that collection of VMs as it entered the VMware cloud environment and was in the background behind the scenes, stored for motion into it, we're able to, through change block tracking, understand the changes that have occurred inside of the VMware uh, SDDC instance proper. And then we can do a, a before and an after comparison as we bring that data back out we bring just the changes and fail back just the changes. So that has a direct impact on the cost of the solution by minimizing the egress charges. So very few solutions out there can provide change only fail back uh, you know, to the primary data center. So if you're putting 100 terabytes into the cloud in a failover situation, you're gonna bring back typically at least 100 terabytes out when you wanna fail back. And there's gonna be a, a fair amount of cost associated with that you know, uh, from an egress standpoint unless you're benefiting from something like a direct connect with uh, AWS. Now, uh, as you fail back, the, the second impact or benefit that that mechanism has, that ability to do change only fail back, is the time it takes to fail back. Because with traditional solutions, even if there's no VM conversion involved and, and so on and so forth, they, there's still this need to bring back 100% or more of what I actually failed over. And to bring that back on premise, there's just simply the amount of time it takes to transfer the data and then everything else that goes that happens after that data is back on site to bring it back up and, and operationalize it. You're talking potentially hours, days, and, and in some cases weeks, depending on the scale of the infrastructure. So now that, that might be as painful as the initial un, unplanned outage and disaster that we had. So these types of things uh, around, uh, around failback and so forth, are really important that we consider these. And, and so we have from a Datrium standpoint and through this change only fail back mechanism, we can drastically reduce the time it takes uh, to fail back on prem. Okay, so now at the end of this, of course, then we would shut down that VMware cloud instance and the meter that's currently, that was then currently spinning is now stopped and we're no longer incurring any charges from a VMware cloud perspective. But to your questions earlier, just to kind of expand on that, what, we, what you just saw there was the activation of a VMware SDDC instance on demand, and then it's deactivation when it was no longer needed. Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward that any of the costs associated with that would start and stop with those two events. Now, there are still other charges that are ongoing and will be ever present in order to have this type of infrastructure in place to do a DR. The first is, of course, the S3 back data store. You're going to pay for uh, the ability to store your backup data in the cloud. Again, we, we do a, a, a true global data reduction between on-prem and the cloud. And so that's, that's part of how we do this change only fail back. But the important point is that we're drastically reducing the cost of storing data in the cloud in two ways. One, because we, we do, uh, you know, again, that, that always on data reduction. And the second is there's no, reformatting conversion or repatriation of that data between one storage environment and another. There are many DR mechanisms on the marketplace today that will use an S3 back data store. Most do not do data reduction. And uh, even if they do, and oftentimes what, they, what you have to do or what's going on behind the scenes to actually do a recovery and a failover into SDDC or something like that is going to be uh, a, a copy of that data being made into like an EBS back volume. And, and that once it's in there, of course, then they can operationalize that. So there's additional cost with the EBS. There's the time it takes to move the data into that EBS and build all that stuff out. And so, again, that, that's, that's a challenge. And those are the types of things we wanted to completely avoid. Okay. Is that starting to, to get to the, some of the questions that you were uh, asking earlier? It does. Yeah, very good. Okay. Awesome. So we're gonna keep moving forward here. 
Uh, now, what this is meant to represent is essentially the same talk threat that we just went through, except instead of a fully on-demand SDDC out here, we have something running all the time. So we typically call this pilot light. We would right-size the pilot light for the amount of infrastructure required um, for the target workload. Typically, it's a nominal workload. We're running some infrastructure services out there, DNS, AD. Maybe we're running some virtual load balancers and global load balancers. Uh, perhaps some security appliances, what have you, whatever is appropriate for the given uh, use case can be run in those, you know, three uh, SDDC hosts that are running out there steady state. And the additional advantage is that we don't have to wait for that SDDC to built, be built up from scratch. We can immediately, when we hit that button to do the failover, we can, it'll, it'll mount those VMs to that SDDC instance and start them. And, and then again, the story remains the same as I just went through on the previous set of slides. And so that's the big advantage. And we talked about the different methods for deployment, uh, you know, uh, and, and to your question about RTO and RPO and things like that, we can vary those depending on the use case. And so with, again, with pilot light, that affords us the ability to remove the two to three hour time it takes on average for our, our software to, in an automated fashion, build out that SDDC from scratch on demand. Okay, so that's, uh, I guess that VMware SDDC, those, uh... I know those EBSs are essentially pre-warmed, right? Yeah, well, so in this case, what the way this would work is, uh, you know, is when we, when, if we were to design a solution that looked like this for, uh, for a customer, the SDDC instance would be uh, right-sized for the workload, and that would amount to some number of VMC hosts, reserved hosts is what they're called from a v VMC perspective. I'm sure you're familiar with those. Yep. So instead of an on-demand hourly charge, you know, times the number of hosts, times the amount of time, what we're, what we're looking at is saying, okay, well, we know we're going to need at least three or four uh, hosts to handle the workload. And so we're going to go ahead and for a reduced cost, because we're pre-buying that at a reserved rate, we can reserve those instances up front and then benefit from, the, again, those pricing advantages. And then for everything else, those things would be on demand. So this would be an always on SDDC with auto scaling to grow it to the final endpoint, which may be eight, six, 10, or even up to 16 VMC hosts. Okay. So reserve instances with auto scaling. Exactly. Yep. So some of this should be familiar for anybody that's watching this uh, that has experience with VMware's cloud. Uh, you know, we use some of the same terminology, uh, you know, some of the same concepts apply. It's just how we leverage them in context of the DR use case. So fair enough. Fair. Awesome. Okay. So we're just going to skip through some of this since we really talked through uh, most of these pieces. It's all the same. It just is, how do you want your, how do you want your steak cooked? What does it look like for your DR? What, what applications are, or what are your applications demanding from an RPO, RTO perspective? Now, a couple other things to consider. This is a nice graphic because this, this, this depicts the, the, the nature of our software and how that's combined with that S3 back data store. And, and how we're able to achieve this is when we store all this data, and again, it's, it's, you know, it's fingerprint, compress, encrypt, and then we fully deduplicate that data inside that, uh, you know, uh, data store and then therefore we're storing a lot more data in a smaller footprint than comparable solutions out there in the marketplace. But we, this is also, as I said, a live data store because of the software, we're able to mount that directly into that VMware Cloud instance via NFS. And then of course our orchestrator will then leverage um, that, uh, that live mount data store to bring those VMs on, online in a much quicker fashion than any other uh, solution out there. The other thing that this really depicts that, I appreciate, depicts that I appreciate is this goes back to the, what I said at the beginning of the conversation, which is the, the Datrium views the world and views uh, these, these uh, type of technology challenges differently than most other vendors. These are not, backup is not independent of dis disaster recovery and certainly should be rationalizing context of orchestration. And this idea of this live mountable data store, particularly in the cloud, is, is unique and it, we also have an analog of, of sorts for this on premise that we're gonna talk about in a minute. So when you, you can have some significant advantages if you look at this as a singular problem set to solve and, and you're gonna have a lot more 
uh, robust, dependable solution because of that. And it's gonna cost a lot less, I think, too, as we talked about in, in a number of different areas. So let's talk about ransomware for a quick second since we, I made a, a, a big deal about that at the beginning as one of the more, uh, the currently one of the greater reasons why folks are looking to DR as a potential way of getting them out of a, a painful situation of a ransomware infection. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the, the, the challenge with ransomware is you're, you're encrypting that data and therefore uh, recovering to the most recent copy of your data that you've backed up is likely not going to be viable because it's going to be infected. So what you need to do is you want the DR mechanism so that you can do an orchestrated recovery, particularly if you're a larger environment, you got a lot of complexity. You don't want to have to do any of that manually. That's why we have orchestration. So you've built out the policy, then, that, then that's, uh, you know, that, that's half the equation. But in the case of ransomware, we also need the ability to uh, apply that, that orchestration to recovery to any point in time backup or recovery point that we have record of. And that's the, that's the beautiful thing about what Daytream's done here is that every last backup that we do, whether it's a backup stored locally on-prem on our DVX uh, DHCI system, or it's on, uh, you know, in the cloud in that live mountable data store, the data is entirely immutable. We never overwrite data. We only write new and then uh, you know, we do what we call space reclamation, which is the nice way of saying uh, you know, garbage collection. So we, as data ages out and there's no longer any references to it and dependencies on it, then, then we can purge it and keep the system clean. This is how SSDs work. This is how many things work. But the, the nature of our data stores, both primary backup and DR related, all being immutable helps us be uh, uh, resilient against the infection of ransomware, meaning that ransomware is never going to affect our backups in, in totality. They can maybe affect a VM that then gets backed up and we store a, a backup copy of encrypted data, but because we can go back to any point in time that we've captured and then do an orchestrated recovery from it, I don't, I'm not aware of any other solution today that can do, uh, can, that can do likewise. So that's a, that's a huge boon for uh, folks that are dealing with ransomware now and are looking to DR as uh, potentially a different or, 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 or a replacement mechanism to you know, manually recovery through uh, you know, operational means like in, in terms of backups. Any questions with that? Um, I guess maybe just uh, what, is, what's the, what are you seeing as a dedupe ratio? I know, you know different workloads have different dedupe ratios, but I guess what's the average that you're seeing? I guess this would be against all VMs anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question, and, and you hit the nail on the head. It just it, it's all dependent on the the format of the data and the the, the data set itself. But um, according to support, uh, who keeps a lot of records on you know our our install base across our entire install base in aggregate without any uh, reservations or qualifications beyond that, uh, our average is three to one uh, data reduction, and I'll just be upfront and these are not like, uh, these numbers that we're, we're quoting are not, uh, they, they're real. Uh, they're, they're not these hero numbers that can, uh, let's count everything as a full backup and then <laughs> I'll apply it by the square root of pi times 12 and suddenly we're at a thousand to one data reduction. I know what up. you're talking about exactly. Yeah, so, so, so it's, it's very transparent, I guess is probably the word I should have, I was looking for. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think we're really proud of that, go ahead. And, that, and that's fine because like you said, right? You know, something doesn't change. Customer keeps it on site and you're doing fulls every night. You know, there's some companies that'll say, hey, listen, you know, we dedupe that. Well, the reality is, is you really didn't dedupe that. You just added that to your dedupe numbers to inflate them because <laughs> you should have thought about doing something with that data to begin with, right? I mean, exactly. if it hasn't been touched in three months, then maybe it needs to be somewhere else then it wouldn't be included in the uh, dedupe ratio. So, right. And the more you dedupe something is uh, the more you got to untangle it when you're trying to restore. It. Exactly. So uh, I think one of the last major differentiators that I wanted to hit on, um, you know, on that list, we talked about backup, we talked about ransomware, we talked about, um, you know, I think one other thing and now really compliance. So if we, if we harken back to uh, one of the pro, uh, you know, kind of problem statements I mentioned up front around traditional DR being highly complex. And as a result, you know, despite our best efforts, small organizations and large organizations 
you know, it's, it's challenging to keep everything in order and keep everything clean and keep everything up to date. You know, especially as you're d dealing with the, uh, uh, you know, the ongoing activities, uh, moves as and changes and things like that. And there is a downstream impact on both backup and disaster recovery. Uh, and so far too often, we, you know, I've run into many, many organizations who, whose DR investments have failed them and uh, because uh, a key change never got pro propagated out to the DR policy that happened in production. So what we've tried to do is to mitigate that from a Datrium perspective, we said, look, if we've got visibility to into and control over a fair percentage of all of the things that are necessary to make DR viable, then why should we not validate those things ahead of time and ahead of a potential DR event or even just a DR test. And so we have a built-in compliance checking engine that looks at everything from the source data sets, the source environments, the source resources, the VMware environment, the vCenter, accessibility, what's the data look like, where is it, what's it labeled as, how many VMs, et cetera, et cetera. We look at that same set of, you know, uh, kind of uh, data, data points on the destination or the DR failover site. And then we looked at some things in between. We look at the, the consistency of the data if, uh, if it's on our DVX platform on-prem. We look at the orchestration policy to make sure that things haven't changed in the environment that we have visibility into um, that would have a direct impact on the policy. So an example of this might be that uh, you know, it actually just happened in our in our demo lab the other day because we've got a lot of people in there, well-meaning folks, and inevitably somebody makes a change and doesn't communicate it, and it and it, and it propagates out. And and we um, one thing was uh, we in order to save save money, of course, as a being good stewards of the business here, we run an always on you know SDDC instance in the cloud, but it's a single host. Uh, and the thing about that is those from a VMware perspective as a policy. Um, get refreshed every 30 days. So we have to restart everything and build everything back up and then we're back up and running. Uh, no different than if we did an on-demand fail over and fail back. And so we do this every 30 days and, and uh, you know, what happened was we're, uh, you know, we're running a demo and this thing got shut down, uh, you know, because one of us wasn't paying attention to the schedule. And so now suddenly what we went into demo was a DR orchestrated failover and then, you know, the policy compliance check, which happens every 30 minutes automatically, showed a red, you know, a red indicator that uh, something is uh, amiss. And, and upon further investi investigation, uh, during that demonstration, we were able to, you know, show how, hey, uh, we, we had to take down replication here, and that was the first error. And then, of course, now the SDDC instance is down. That actually happened later in the day. And so there were multiple reasons why that policy broke. And you can imagine you're in your daily, you know, uh, uh, going through things in an organization. Hey, make this change. Okay, so suddenly the the, the network connectivity is, is is adjusted, and now I don't have reachability into the uh, the SDDC instance. That's going to get flagged on a 30 minute granularity by our policy automatically, and that can get reported out to your compliance controllers uh, again without your intervention. And there isn't anything else out there that provides this level of validation of all of these very important things that all have to work together in concert for DR to be functional and viable. And, that, and that's just a built-in fundamental uh, attribute of our approach to DR. Fair enough? Yeah, very good. But uh, so that, are you using, is that a Datrium uh, compliance check or are you APIing into AWS to use like AWS config for their compliance, validate their compliance? No, this is all within our software and anywhere that we're getting data that may relate to AWS or VMC proper, we would be get, get it, gathering that data via APIs, yes. But the engine itself um, that is going out and pulling things is a part of our software platform. Okay. And reports, I guess. I would think. Yeah, good, good question. So I don't have a diagram of that right now, but we report uh, in three ways. So first is there is a exportable report that goes along with these compliance checks. It's fairly, fairly minimal in terms of its details. It's more of a summary. It's, a, it's the 30 minute check. It's, is it up or down, green light or, or red light? Um, the second type is we do uh, do an audit uh, trail of the config changes for the orchestration policies and the broader DR environment. And so we can report on that and show uh, export reports that detail 
the state changes of configuration within those 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 elements inside the DR environment. You can also trigger alerts on those, right? Precisely. Um, the third uh, and final is in context of a uh, on a, a DR test failover, which is a that is a function, a built-out function within this in the system. So there is a button that says test failover, and it's a you know fully facilitated you know kind of cordoned off environment with a cleanup function. So it's very it's very much automated. Um, that if you do that you know yearly, quarterly, monthly, whatever your policy is, at the end of that test uh, and subsequent cleanup, you can export a report that goes into very extensive, I would say, audit level detail of every step, what happened in what order, how long did each step take, any errors that occurred, why did they occur, et cetera. And of course, these are captured and, and maintained in our SaaS-based platform. Mm -hmm. Good? Very good, yeah. Awesome. So I know we're running short on time. Uh, I had uh, really at the end of the day, we had a couple of um, customer examples and I, I guess I already gave one ad hoc uh, but I think maybe one other thing to point out here that we haven't talked about we alluded to it, it us being an MSP for all of this we are a single one-stop shop for everything as it relates to this DR mechanism inclusive of the AWS the VMC and all those types of things and while there is absolutely uh, important and in some cases, complex work that has to be done to in, in totality to make a BCDR plan functional, everything from the data gathering and analysis and interpretation through to things like, hey, how do we wanna handle network connectivity and reachability into Amazon? How do we wanna deal with our IP addresses that happen to be on-prem? Do we wanna convert those to something else? Do we wanna extend layer two? Do we wanna do a layer three VPN? There are many different ways um, to do these things, of course, we pick the right one for the right job. The point, though, is that, uh, you know, the, in general, our customers of our DR uh, as a service mechanism do not have to have expert, deep effort, expertise in things like VMware SDC or AWS to take advantage of this. We, we, be, we proxy all of that complexity and present that through our software platform as an easy to use and easy to operate uh, you know, single pane of glass uh, type of uh, set of functions. And then, you know, really it's up to the customer to, and you know, with the channel to design and create their actual DR plans and decide what their SLAs are going to be for certain workloads. Yeah, so Datrium masks the complexities of the management of VMware SDBC and AWS. Therefore, customers don't, you know, they don't really have to have any special um, I guess, uh, specialities in either SDBC or AWS, right? Precisely. And I should have said that in addition to that, from an operational perspective, the, the, all of that applies to a billing from a billing standpoint. So you also don't have to have any insight into or any, any manage, there's no management overhead associated with, oh, okay, here's my transfer rate and here's the number of instances of XYZ AWS thing that I have and let me run the, the massive calculator to figure out what my, my, my bill might be uh, if I egress some data or something like that. All of that is handled in, in, by us and, and we proxy that out and, and really simplify it. So you don't have to worry about any of that. You're gonna just get a single bill uh, ultimately from Datrium via the channel. So simplified consolidated billing of some sort? Yeah, you got it, yep. So at the end of the day, I mean, I think we've really covered all the bases and we talked about how cloud backup relates to disaster recovery. Um, but I guess one thing that we didn't really touch on explicitly is the instant RTO and we, we, uh, we, we talked around it, but at the end of the day, um, if you have a Datrium DVX system on-prem, you can get instant operational recovery of the virtual machines onto the primary storage platform with better performance full data reduction and encryption in flight, in use and at rest, um, you know, uh, for that data set, if you have Datrium on-prem, and then that's from a backup standpoint. The other advantage of having Datrium on-prem as the source for what you're gonna replicate out to the cloud is you can get a much greater uh, granularity of RPO down to five minutes uh, via that mechanism. If you're gonna go from any other, platform out there aside from Datrium, we're leveraging DRES Connect leverages VADP through vCenter to access the data. And I'm sure you're well aware of the constraints around VADP. 
most folks are going to be comfortable with once a day, maybe as, as low as four hour, uh, you know, kind of RPO on VADP based backups. And that's what you're going to, uh, you know, achieve with that. But everything else from a disaster recovery remains consistent uh, in terms of the experience, the option to have on demand or pilot light and things like that. So the decision process is pretty simple. You know, look at the, the totality of the DR capability. And if it makes sense, we need to determine for the workloads, um, you know, do, can, is a four hour RPO okay? Yeah, great. DRS connect all the way, don't change anything about your infrastructure and benefit from a fully orchestrated DR experience like we've talked about. If you say, hey, look, I, I really need that number to go down. I need one hour, I need 10 minutes. I've got a database that needs to be backed up hourly. Um, and that's a great situation to bring in the DHCI platform from Datrium. Okay, so that's the DVX, yeah? Correct. Okay, so any RPOs less than, let's say, 10 minutes is put, look to put, and it doesn't even need to be a DVX that's sizing to take everything, right? It's, it's just, hey, listen, I'll just size it for that workload, which may be 10% of whatever workload it is. So like, can I have them both? So of course. that 10% workload, which is I need my, you know, um, within 10 minutes, because that's one of the requirements of a data set. Yeah. And I, I probably have a little... DVX on the end. What's the minimum size DVX thing? Even? Small, the smallest DVX has 29 terabytes usable after overhead, and uh, that is before data reduction. So two, one, two, three to one, and you can do the math on how much effective capacity you'll have on that. So now, and the cool thing though, to take it one step further as an example, let's say I'll pick on Pure. So customer just bought Pure, they love it and they're happy. Uh, but they really want this type of DR mechanism, et cetera. And so you know, you know, the bulk of their workload, uh, four hours or greater RPO is fine. So that's DRAS Connect. Um, but then you said like 10% of their workload said, yeah, I mean, we got to get this down to five minutes. Um, so what, what can we do? Well, let's take your three-tiered architecture, which consists of somebody's servers attached to a network with a pure storage array on the other end. Mm -hmm. Let's make this take some host, make sure that there's sufficient SSDs in those. We add the Datrium data node, and then our software goes on top of those uh, um, on those on those designated hosts. And so we can take a brownfield environment and insert very much non-disruptively uh, with minimal cost Datrium's you know on-prem DVX capability, and have a what, let's call it a hybrid system that is this three-tier pure-based environment that's mm -hmm. essentially brand new, and then have uh, you know a portion of it with the Datrium capabilities as well. DVX. So it's Datrium software sitting on a host that is using, say, Pure, for example? No, no, not using, not using Pure. Think of it as uh, uh, an adjacent storage backend. So if you've got a Pure storage array and you had it sitting next to an EMC storage array, functionally, it's the same thing. It'd be Pure sitting next to the Datrium data store. Oh, but the Datrium data store is made up from a physical standpoint, is made up of a data node connected to some quantity of VMware based uh, ESXi hosts or servers yeah. with our Datrium software running on both those hosts as well as uh, on the uh, data node. And of course the software running on the host is it's, it's just a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a plugin into, into vCenter, non-disruptively. Okay. So, so you have your own hardware essentially. So what you're saying? Uh, no, well, we're a software-only, um, you know, company. Uh, there is this this notion of a data node in in the DVX portion of our portfolio. Mm -hmm. That piece is something that we've uh, offloaded to uh, Avnet uh, as the fulfillment engine for okay. that piece of hardware. Yeah. So yeah, there is technically hardware involved. Okay, so right, you're the, you're software defined, um, to, just like the Cohesity, for example, and they just partner with whoever to fulfill the backend. Yeah, precisely. But that back end, of course, is a is a specific designed appliance device, again, sourced through Avnet. It's it's not, I want to make it very clear that you cannot take Datrium software and for the persistent storage media, uh, leverage someone else's storage platform, like a pure array or an EMC right. array or a NetApp array. It has to be this specific device coming from Avnet. Okay, well, that's good to know. That's certainly yeah. something we learned today, the DVX what? and the Dir Direct Connect. Yeah, and, and I know we, we're running out of time and there's, and there's certain very important points that I'm glossing over on a DVX side and certainly happy to follow up with you directly, but just keep in mind that there, it's not, I, uh, while I'm kind of likening it to a storage array, it is not 
like a traditional storage array in terms of cost and complexity and things like that. The, the device itself is is very much a commoditized uh, you know element and storage device because everything that's really important, heavy lifting, the performance, the storage implementation of storage services is all done in software on the hosts. They really that DVX data node is nothing more than uh, a, a, a very inexpensive 2U rack mount server with a shelf of disks in it, and typically spinning disks. And uh, we use that to be that cold, golden copy of persistent data for the environment where the working set of data is actually stored in local SSD or NVMe cache in each of the hosts. The net result is we will outperform any other HCI or three-tiered architecture platform out there from a storage perspective. And we're, we're going to do that with having always on data reduction and encrypting that data in use in flight and at rest, both primary data and all of the backup secondary data. Okay, got it. Um, I think I just had one last question, sure. um, which would be, uh, what the hell was it? Ah, the encryption component. I guess yeah. that's, uh, that's your, your encryption. So even when you're going into AWS, you're using uh, sort of client owned encryption keys is that right uh so 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 every place where data and lands so uh dvx and data center one dvx and data center two and cloud dvx in amazon data center each one of those will maintain its own set of keys so there's separation of duties on prem with the dvx um the encryption keys are managed internally within the dvx system itself in the cloud and i apologize for the background noise in the uh, in the cloud, we will be leveraging Amazon's native encryption functionality and key management, and but we do that behind the scenes with our software. Okay. So. Very good. Yep. Yeah, definitely appreciate the the questions and interaction. Um, absolutely. Okay. Very good. Ron. Uh, that was great. You know, I was just staying fairly quiet because. Uh, you two, uh, David and Matthew, you've got all the expertise. I'm just setting up the framework to have a lot of this great dialogue. We're going to make all this content available at angelbeat.com, along with trying to get the same information at datrium.com. I hope everyone stays safe. I'm going to end the webinar now and make sure all of you wash your hands often and continue to practice social distancing. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan.